Okay. And we do appreciate your willingness to spend it with us after this beautiful day. Where I come from, if, you, if we'd had a day like today there, nobody would have showed up. They'd all been out in Jordan. <laughs> I was showing some of the brothers uh, pictures of our, our ministry in Chicago. In the suburbs, there's Wednesday night. I left the church building about 11 o'clock, I guess. And snow had been, it'd been snowing since Tuesday. And it wasn't, it's not, we, we weren't having a, a heavy snow. It's just a, a light kind of snow. You won't understand what that is, but <laughs> we've had five inches in f six hours. That's a heavy snow. We got five inches in about a day and a half. That's a slow, steady snow, which is what we were having. And it's beautiful. And I, I, I was taking pictures and at almost midnight at night when it snowed all day, the ambient light, and in the city there's always light, but everything is white. The trees are white, the ground is white, so it's like a bright moonlit night, and you're out in it. And it's, it's gorgeous, plus it, of course it's 17 degrees. <laughs> and that means you don't want to stay out and luxuriate in it too long. <coughs> So you take a picture and then run in the house. Or in my case, you get in the car. A number of years ago, my wife, we bought a car, and we buy second-hand cars. <coughs> Excuse me, but this was a, a nice second-hand car. And it had a remote starter in it. Now this was about 1990-something. And it had this remote starter in it. I never didn't know what that was. Now, I have to tell you, my wife fell in love with two things in that car. One was the fact that it's got a button on the door that could sit, adjust your seat, because when she gets in, the seat's up. When I get in, the seat's back. And this is gonna be her car, so she didn't have to adjust the seat for me. She could push the button, and it was, right, and it was wonderful. And the other thing was that remote starter. And after about a week, she told me, we'll never have another car without the seat adjustment or the remote starter. Because <laughs> what the remote starter does is you can start the car 15 minutes before you go out there, and even if it's 15 degrees, when you get there, the car's nice and warm. That's wonderful. Then I discovered you can, if it's 90 degrees out, you can start the car and the air conditioner cools it off. And the only excuse to having leather seats in a car is if you have a car start, a remote starter. Uh, because leather seats are miserable in cold weather. Because about the time you get where you want to go, they've warmed up. <laughs> and it's a little late by then. But uh, there was some reason I was telling you that, but my wife has said, move on. So I <laughs> the point is, we're glad you're here, and we're glad we're here. Uh, and uh, if, if you had trouble getting here, it's going to be worth it this weekend. This is a great opportunity. My topic tonight is, I think John said, is uh, believing the, the, the word rightly divided. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to talk with you, I'm going to adjust the topic just a little bit and tell you that in order to believe the Bible, you must rightly divide the Bible. And if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you do not have the capacity or the freedom to believe the Bible. You have to believe things out of it, pieces of it, but not it in its entirety. And that's going to be, that's an important distinction, and it demonstrates the importance of dispensational Bible study. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege we have of studying together, of gathering together. We pray that the things we go over tonight might provide light and understanding in the hearts of eager seekers, might bring some conviction to the hearts of people that don't have that, that desire just to let your word be the authority. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. The passage is 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know the passage. I don't really need to talk to you about it. This chart is the, the thing that we're talking about. I'm going to show you how that chart is. That, that, that's a timeline that just illustrates something in the scripture. By the way, the first time this chart was ever used was in this meeting. Back in the 1980s. Harold, most of you don't remember Harold probably. And Ted, most of you probably remember Ted. <laughs> But Harold built a chart out of, I think it must have weighed 90 pounds, out of plywood, and Ted painted it. 
And I got out here that, that you know, I had been coming out several years and I just draw it on the board. I had someone write me a, a note recently, watches our TV program, and they wrote me and they said, you know, we've always, I've always called you the scribbler. Now a lot of people call me the chalkboard guy. They don't know who I am, they say the, the chalkboard guy. But this lady, she says, I call you the scribbler because by the time you finish drawing on that chalkboard, it looks like just a bunch of scribbling. <laughs> And she said, I'm watching you. And I said, that scribbler's on there again. And she said, but you know, by the time you got through, I was getting it. <laughs> and even if, the, even if it looks like scribbles, I was getting it. Because the clarity that right division brings lets you get it. And once you get it, you don't ever want to be without it. And if you've never gotten it, well, you want to listen more carefully because this is how you get it. And it won't be the scribbling. So I'll scribble a little bit but I'll point to the chart more so you can read it. But the first time we ever did that was with, with Harold and Ted did it. And I'll never forget, because the chart closes up to talk about the prophetic program. And I can still remember that when I opened that chart for the very first time, because it was sitting on the, on the board like that, and I opened it for the first time, and that mystery section showed up, and there went a <sighs> across the... You remember that, John. And I thought, wow, that's more powerful than I thought it was. <laughs> because it's an illustration in visual form of what Paul's talking about when he says, right and divide in the word of truth. So as the chart, of the, it's really a timeline, not so much a chart, isn't so much the issue. It's the verses that we're going to look at, but this is a visual representation of it. So don't get caught up in the, the diagram. Get caught up in the truth the diagram is showing, okay? 2 Timothy 2.15, study. If you don't have a King James Bible, your Bible doesn't say study. You need to learn to study your Bible. Nobody that uses modern versions studies the Bible. They study things about the Bible. The Bible is the only book you'll ever, you'll ever find that people study it by studying books about it, but not studying it. If you're going to study the Bible, and that's what you need to do with your Bible, it's not meant just for devotional reading. It's meant to be studied much study is awareness to the flesh. It requires effort. That's why people don't like to, the idea of studying the Bible. But the main reason people don't like it is because they don't know how. They don't understand how to do it. You buy books on hermeneutics, books on how to study the Bible, they give you 15, 20 different ways of doing it. You can pick the one that you like or the four or five that you like and execute through a passage and come up with a blank. But if you do it God's way, then you come up with something different. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's the goal. It's got nothing to do with having my approval. My approval and 50 cents will get you. Well, that won't buy you a cup of coffee anymore, will it? <laughs> my wife bought a glass of ice. You know, I go, we, we go out to eat at a restaurant. I refuse to. I drink, I drink the, the drink God made, not Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I do drink that, but I drink water. Because I just cannot bring myself to pay $3 for a glass of iced tea in San Juan Capistrano today, it was $3.90. <laughs> By the way, the gas prices down the street are $1 more than I paid yesterday in Chicago. I didn't think it got worse in Chicago. So, you know, that, such as, you know, say la vie, such as what it is. But $3, three for a glass of, so I just, I just order water. Water, that's good. God made water, and I, and I don't need to do it up. Well, I don't care about whose approval you want. God's approval is what counts. Study to show thyself approved unto God. It's not a church. It's not a denomination. It's not a system. It's not a government. It's God's approval. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. You're going to face God. You're not going to face me. And so that every one of us should give account of himself to God. And that's where it comes down to. And what, what's going on with these kind of things on a weekend like this is you get right down to the skinny of things. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman. There's work to do, folks. There's a work of ministry to be involved in. Do you want to be involved in the work of the ministry? We have a lot of spectators. You know, you have, people have large, big churches with entertainment venues. Listen, if you go into a church and what, you look, what it looks like is a rock venue, and you've got a skinny jean pastor with low lights and blue lights, and all, 
you know what you've got? You've got an entertainment venue. And that's fine if that's what you want. You can go to some churches and it's a theater venue with all the rites and service. If that's what you want, that's fine. But listen, that's not what God's doing today. That's what religion's doing. That's what people are doing. That's what tradition's doing. But God has a work of ministry to do. And God, I say, would help all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's what the work of the ministry focuses on. And if you want to be involved in that, this verse tells you, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. You're going to be doing what God's doing. I've said it for years. People say, I want to do the will of God. I want to be in the center of God's will. I want to do God's will in my life. You need to quit worrying about you and think about Him. Because if you want to do God's will in your life, go find out what God is doing today and then go do that and you'll be doing God's will. See, we worry about where does God want us at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon and what does He want us to be eating? And should I be a missionary? Should I marry this person? Should I go over there? To the... And God's focus isn't on what you're doing. His focus is on what He's doing. And when you understand what He's doing in the world, then you go do that in your life, and in your life you will be doing God's will. So how do I know what God's doing? Rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth has to be the authority. But when you study it, you have to rightly divide it. Now, look at what that says. It's not talking about dividing truth from error because there's no error in the word of truth. All there is in the word of God is truth. Now, there are lies. Satan tells lies. It records it, but it's the truth of what he said. But what's in God's word is truth. But there's some truth in God's Word that's meant to be separated from other truth, divided from other truth. God has made distinctions in His Word that if you rightly understand them, you'll get the profit out of God's Word that He put in it for you. Chapter 3 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. If you want the profit that God put in His Word for you, so that God's Word can work effectually in you when you believe it, then you have to rightly divide His Word so that you have an understanding of how to be saved, who you are in Christ, where you fit in the program of God, what your instructions are, when it starts, when it ends, and why God's doing it. If you can understand salvation and your identification and the purpose that God has, your walk, your hope, if you can grab, uh, grasp all that, you'll have a successful Christian life. It won't matter what the circumstances in your life are. You'll have the, the life of Jesus Christ living in and through you in all the details of life. And you'll have that approval. So it's important to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. Just keep reading if you will verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Notice there is, there is some, I love that word babbling. <laughs> Vain talk. Blah, 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 blah. Talk, 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 but never get to the point. And it's, it, it, it produces more ungodliness. And their word will eat, it doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying, that the resurrection is untrue. No, no. no. no that's what it says. See that? It didn't say, they said, there's no resurrection. Now, there are people that said that, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, thou fool. That's how you answer that. You're nuts. <laughs> you know. So I said, how do you know there's a God? Go look in the mirror. It don't look so great, but that's not him, that's you, but that tells you he's there. If there's a creation, there had to be a creator. Right. You know, every dumb thump knows that. In this passage, they aren't denying the resurrection. What did they do? They said it's past. They have a timeline, and they have the resurrection at the wrong place on the timeline. That's what dispensational Bible study is about. It's a timeline and you put things that God's doing, a dispensation is that which is dispensed. To dispense something is to give it out. What's given out, the noun form of the verb, is a dispensation. 
And God has dispensed different programs at different places along the timeline. You need to understand where you are on the timeline. So come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Many years ago, now it's back in the deep dark recesses of eternity past almost. When you get old, that's the way you feel about your past. I read those passages and I've studied. I, I, I've, ever since I got, I got saved when I was 15 years old. And I wasn't a bookworm before I got saved, but after I got saved, I just became consumed with the desire to understand God's Word. I began to read God's Word, to read it over and over and over and over and over again. And I've done that for the past 50-something years. I'm, I'm, I can't keep up with how many years it is in my head so quickly, you know. I, I got a ring on my finger. My wife and I celebrated our 50th anniversary last summer, and she bought me this gold ring to remind me that... <laughs> It's gold because that was, a, she's reminding me that was the golden anniversary. Now she didn't want gold, she wanted diamonds. <laughs> and I think that's the 75th. <laughs> so she's planning on that one ahead. Already, she's already working on that one, which is fine. I'd be, I'd be happy to be around for that one too. But when, you, when, when I started out, I just wanted to study. And I read everything I could read. I read my Bible, then I read everything I could read about the Bible. And I discovered there were 50 different ways, and I just did more than that, of approaching God's Word. And I said to myself, I said, you know, if the Apostle Paul is the one that God through Paul tells me to rightly divide the Word, maybe God through Paul will tell me how to do it. Now that's a simplistic approach, I understand. I had a whole shelf of books that had ideas about do, don't, here's how, here's how not to. And I said, well, maybe I just go and let's ask Paul. And I just started reading, and I'll give you a hint about studying your Bible. When you get a question and you don't know the answer, don't just assume there's no answer. Assume there is an answer. Just assume you don't know it yet. Put it in the back of your mind and keep reading. And what I, what I did is I said, I'm just going to keep reading Paul's epistle with that thought in the back of my mind. How would he do it? And I began to discover there were passages in his epistles where he explains how to do it. And there are two very particular passages. Ephesians chapter 2, is, for me, is the most helpful. Verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. So there's, there's a time in the Bible, and he calls it time past. And there's some things that are, that, are, that are very clear about what time past is about. And you can see it on the chart over there. I'll draw it up here because this makes me happy to be able to, <laughs> to, to talk and do that at the same time. I can walk and chew gum and talk all at the same time. I can talk, I can draw on the board, and I can misspell words at the same time. That's embarrassing to do on the television. See, you just don't, you know, if you see it, 100 people doesn't matter too much, whoever's on the internet. But when it's on the TV, and the guys that are doing the, the, the guys that are doing the camera and stuff, and they're, they're doing, I got no idea what they're talking about. I just... You know, if I'm, if I'm talking like this and my wife's giving me facial gestures, the first thing is you wonder if your fly is open. <laughs> that's, that's just the first thing, you know. But when these guys are doing it, I'm figuring I've learned I've misspelled a word. So I usually abbreviate words just because it's easier to say I abbreviated it than to misspell it. <laughs> Time passed, verse number 11. You were Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. So there's two groups of people in time past. There's the circumcision and there's the uncircumcision. Now there's stuff that happened in the Bible prior to that. If you go back in Genesis, the first 11 chapters, you start with Adam and you go all the way over here to, to, to 
uh, uh, Noah and so forth. You come over here to Abraham, and God calls Abraham out, and he, out of Abraham he makes the circumcision. Paul's going to go back just to here. He's not going to he'll go back to Adam in Romans 5. But here we're going to pick up here because the issue that's being dealt with here is going to be the circumcision, okay? But the things that he's going to institute here, they go all the way back to Adam, and that's Romans 5. You're, they were called the circumcision. I'm sorry, this is Israel, okay? And that's the Gentiles. Now notice why this is important. Verse number 12, that at that time, you, Gentiles, were without Christ. Jesus Christ comes in his earthly ministry, and you'll find his earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those books. And in those books, that text says, you Gentiles were without, Christ is up here, and you're down here, and you don't have a claim on him up there. Why were they without Christ? Being. They had a state of being. Now that's important to understand. It's important. You have to live out of who you be. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. God had made covenants. He'd made promises. He'd given some hope. And he gave all of it to the nation Israel. And he didn't give it to the Gentiles. They're without hope. In fact, in Genesis, Romans chapter 1, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 17, when God gave up the nations back here, he, he left them to walk in their ignorance. He left them to walk in their own way. They didn't like to retain God of their knowledge, so God gave them up, go on your way. And he called out one man, Genesis chapter 12, if you will. And he said, I'm going to take that one man and I'm gonna make a nation out of him. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter number 12. Radical thing happens in the earth here. God abandons, all of mankind abandons the God of the creation. They say, we don't want Jehovah, we want all the gods of the nations, all the gods of the adversary. And so God says, okay, you don't want me, have what you want. One of the in order to deal with man's rebellion, God doesn't have to work up a sweat. He just leads you to yourself because you're your worst enemy anyway. He abandons, they abandon him. So he, he says, okay, I'll conclude them in a, the world in unbelief. Then he calls out one man named Abra, Abe, Abe, Abram, Genesis 12. And now the Lord God had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy, kin thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. So there's going to be a land over here that's going to be important. God's going to give to Abraham. Ab Ab Abram. His name becomes Abraham in Genesis 17. And in Genesis 17, God says, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. And from hence on, from now on, that's how you're supposed to be named. So when I talk about him, I call him Abraham because we're after Genesis 17. So when I'm reading in Genesis 12, he's still Abraham to me because that's after I know better. Okay, so when I use that, there are people who get real bent out of shape if you don't say Abram until you get to Genesis 17. I'm just telling you, if I don't do that, I just told you why, Okay justified myself <laughs> verse 2 and I will make of thee a great nation so he's going to give him a land and he's going to make him a great nation and I will bless them I will bless thee and make thy name great so he's going to give him a land a nation and a blessing and I'm going to make your name great And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. The way God's going to deal with people back here is on the basis of how you treat Israel. He has one client nation in the earth, and that's the nation Israel, the circumcision. 
And the way you treat Israel is going to determine how he treats you. You bless them, he'll bless you. You curse them, you're dead meat. You follow that? When you find God dealing with people on that basis in your Bible, you know you're in time past because that's what Ephesians 2 says time past is. So when I'm reading my Bible and I'm reading through and I find that God deals with people on the basis of that distinction, I know where I'm at because Ephesians 2 told me where I'm at. Now, settle that right now because that's going to be important because when we get over here a little bit, that's going to mess with the way you thought it ought to be. And when it starts messing with the way you thought it ought to be, you've got to understand why it's messing with it and it's right and you're not. When I say you, I mean your system, okay? I am trying to go slow. I, I really am putting the brakes on to go slow. <laughs> and it hurts. Verse number three. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I'm going to bless you and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed in you. So God promised Abraham a land. Promised him a nation to come from him and promised to bless that nation and through that nation bless all the families of the earth. So back here, if a Gentile wanted to get to God, where would he go? He wouldn't go to God, he'd go through to God through Israel. So it's important to understand when you're in time past, that's the program. And all back here in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets and all this, this stuff back here is designed to enhance and explain and amplify that program. Now come with me to Genesis 17. Verse number 4. As for me, behold my covenant, this is Jehovah talking, as for me, behold my covenant is with thee, talking to Abraham, and thou shalt be father of many nations. Neither shall thy, thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. So from now on, you should call him Abraham. And we are from now on, so we call him Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So who's, who's he, God is going to be a God to who? He's going to be a God to the nation Israel. He's going to be a God to the seed that comes through Israel, the seed of Abraham. And he's the one who's going to bring the blessing to that nation. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. So how long does the deed for the, for, for, for the land of, of Israel belong to Abraham? Forever. Forever. It doesn't make any difference what the Palestinian state, doesn't make any difference what President Trump, doesn't make any difference what the United Nations, doesn't make any difference what, what anybody says. God said, he's the creator, he owns it all. And he said, I've given the deed to the land to Abraham and to his seed forever. Now they might not be occupying it, but it's theirs, okay? And God said unto Abraham, that, and by the way, that's important because 97% of Christendom doesn't believe that. 97% of every, the only people that understand that's true are dispensationalists. That's what makes you a dispensationalist. It requires you to be a dispensationalist. Everybody else thinks they're Israel and that God vacated, vitiated all those promises to Israel and made us the recipients of all the blessings. And they don't believe there's a physical, that, that, that there's a future for national Israel. That's why, for almost 2,000 years, the church, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church after it, have been anti-Semitic. Because they don't understand the purpose and plan that God had for the nation Israel. Still, it's His purpose and plan, because it's going to be, it's forever. Verse 9, God said unto Abraham, 
Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in the generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So what does circ where did circumcision come from? It came from God said, that's what Abraham's got to do. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. See that? Romans chapter 4, Paul says it's a, a sign and a seal. It's the figure. Circumcision in the flesh made by hands was the, the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. So what circumcision is in the Bible is a religious issue. It has nothing to do with hygiene or any of that kind of stuff. It, has, it is a religious symbol, sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Abraham went and had a kid on his... God said, I'm going to give you this seed. And Abraham didn't have a kid. And he's getting old. He's getting worried. He thought maybe I'll help God out. And he went and had a kid on his own, Ishmael. God said, I don't want Ishmael. You did that. That's not the seed line. He waited till Abraham and Sarah physically couldn't have children. and said, okay, now I'm going to give you a kid. Sarah said, you crazy old man, what are you talking about? And she laughed. That is a laughable thing. And yet God, it wasn't a virgin birth, but it was a miraculous conception. Because God took Abraham and Sarah, who were dead reproductively, and gave them a child, miraculously. And so he says, here's the sign. That kid didn't come from what you do. That's Ishmael. Cast him out. That kid came when you were dead, and you couldn't have a kid. And so the circum sign of circumcision Death to Abraham's ability to reproduce. This kid didn't come from any human source. It came, God produced it. Yet it's a physical seed in the earth because God gave them the capacity to have it. So circumcision is a picture in the Bible of death to what you do and God's production of, of his people in spite of who you are and what, you do, what, you can, what Abraham couldn't do. So where circumcision came from was that issue. And all through your Bible, all through the Old Testament scripture we call it, all through back here, God deals with people on that basis. Now come with me if you will to the book of Matthew. Because when you get over here, the book of Matthew chapter 1, and when you get to Matthew chapter 1, do you have a page in your Bible right before Matthew chapter 1 that says something? What does it say? The New Testament. Now, the problem with that is Matthew isn't the New Testament. Look with me at Hebrews chapter number 9. Hold your hand here and look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number... ...16. For where a testament is... There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now Jesus Christ dies at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not in the beginning, but at the end. So based on that verse, I know something. I know that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still in the Old Testament at least until you come to Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. You follow that? So all of a sudden I know I can't really trust the headings in my Bible to be correct. You follow that? I got to be willing to say, uh-oh, the traditional way of doing this isn't necessarily going to be the way God's thinking works out. Because we're still in the Old Testament. You're also still in time past. Look with me at Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter 10. And while you're getting that, get Romans chapter 15.
Romans 15, verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister. Now understand, Jesus Christ is God. He's God in human flesh. Paul says he's the, 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 God, uh, uh, the manifestation of the Godhead bodily. All the Godhead is bodily manifesting. He's the Word who became flesh. He's our Savior. But he also was a minister. He preached. He was a prophet. He preached for three and a half years. He ministered for three and a half years. I was talking about that aspect of it. Now I said that Jesus Christ was a minister of what? Of the circumcision. For the truth of God to confirm what? The promises made to who? You see how you're up here on this side? These dudes down here don't have any access to that. Jesus Christ is a minister of the circumcision. Then when God deals with people on the basis of the distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, where am I? I'm in time past. You know what that tells me? The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John fit in time past. If you're wandering around in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John trying to find your life and instructions for your life, how you ought to pray, how you ought to function, how your church ought to operate, you're out on a snipe hunt. You're just out wandering around in the wilderness, and anything you find and pick up is not going to help you. That's where most people are out wandering around. Purposeless. Lost. Because that's not us. That's time past. By the way, I didn't finish reading Ephesians. But when you keep reading in Ephesians chapter 2, when he talks about this, then he talks about a time he calls, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far from made nigh, there comes a time when God changes that program. And in that but now period, he's forming the church, the body of Christ, where we are today. Then one day, that's going to end, and when it ends, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, he talks about the ages to come. Out here in the future, all the things he planned and promised back here, all the things he's accomplishing today, Christ is going to come and fulfill them. So you have time past, but now, and the ages to come. See that? That's important. Now you see that on the big chart. That's important. Because this is where we are. We're not in the time past. How do you know you're in time past? when God deals with people on that basis of that distinction. That's what he's doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go back with me. Matthew chapter 10. Have you ever heard anybody talk about the Great Commission? The Great Commission, that, that phraseology is not in the Bible. That phraseology was developed in the 1800s, the mid-1800s, in order to promote mission, missionary activity in, in Burma and China. And it was designed to raise money from Europeans, from, from, from uh, England, the, uh, the, the uh, British Empire, and from America to support missions in, in Burma first and then India and China. And Adnan Judson and Hudson Taylor and those guys, they used it as a, as a money-raising technique that you need to follow the Great Commission. And by that they meant the commissions in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, and Acts 1, the post-resurrection commission. That's why when people talk about the Great Commission, they're always talking about missionary activity, because that's where the term came from. If you went back to 1800, 1750, nobody talked about it because they didn't use the term. I mean, you Google that and you'll find that. Google's wonderful, you know. <laughs> You find all kinds of wonderful things. My wife and my, my, one of my grandsons, they argue a lot. And uh, he, uh, he's never wrong unless he's talking to his grandmother. <laughs> and then he's off, that's the immovable force hitting the, <laughs> irresistible force hitting the immovable object. And so they wind up Googling each other. And which one can Google each other the fastest? Well, Google some of this stuff and find out about it. The Great Commission really begins in Matthew chapter 10. Mark, uh, the, the post-resurrection commissions are very small snippets of what the apostles were to do. Matthew 10 
Jesus commissions his apostles, and he commissions them, and he takes them all the way through their whole ministry, through Pentecost, the tribulation, the kingdom, to when he comes back. Now, that's the whole scope. It's right there in Matthew chapter 10. So the great commission, to get all of it in one thing, is in Matthew 10. Notice how he starts. When he called unto him the twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now that's, that's pretty significant. So he calls unto him his twelve disciples. He gave them this power, this authority. Now the name of the twelve, what? You see how there were disciples in verse 1, then he gives them this authority, and now they are apostles? This is where he commissions them to be the twelve apostles. And he says, he lists their names, verse 2 and 3 and 4, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, but the rest of that verse you don't like too much. Because if that's what you're doing today, you couldn't preach here tonight. If you're following Matthew, you can't preach here tonight. Unless you just don't, that's the reason I said, to believe the Bible, you have to write to divide the Bible. Because people, are, people all over this territory are trying to obey the book of Matthew. And that you, book of Matthew says, the people that he's talking to go not into the way of the Gentiles. Duh, that's you dudes. <laughs> and then they said to the Samaritans, and you're not, you don't have that problem because you're not even in Samaria. One of the dumbest things you'll ever hear a preacher say. I heard it just on the radio this, last week on my radio station in Chicago, the one I'm on. Nice preacher, I know the guy. Nice guy, just dumber than a post when it comes to this stuff, though. He's quoting Acts chapter 1. You receive power if the Holy Ghost come upon you. And you should be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most parts of the world. I said, Jerusalem, that's your hometown. Are you reaching your hometown? The guys he's talking to in Acts chapter 1, and he says, Jerusalem, not one man standing there was from Jerusalem. It wasn't their hometown. The angel said, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? All those guys are from up north. Jerusalem's down south. That's my wife. There's a difference between being from the north and the south. <laughs> Not one man standing there was Jerusalem, his hometown. Neither was Judea, his home territory. That's the southern two king nations. Samaria is the landmass of the northern kingdom. That's where they were all from, up in Galilee. Duh. But preachers say, well, that's your home. You know what that is? That's teaching you not to believe the Bible. Right. Jerusalem doesn't mean Jerusalem. Look it up on a map in the back of your Bible. Jerusalem is not in Illinois. It's not in California. It's not in the Western Hemisphere at all. It's in the Middle East. They all knew where it was. And they knew it wasn't their hometown. So when he says, go not in the way of the Gentile. And in the city of the Samaritans, enter, you know, they, they knew exactly what he's talking about. I'm trying to say to you, that's time past. Now when you put it where it goes and leave it where it goes, it won't be such a problem for you. And it'll help you because when you go over in Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew 7, for example, with the Sermon on the Mount, and it says, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. Ask, A-S-K. That's how you pray. Prayer is asking. And whatsoever you ask in faith, believing, you'll receive. You ever try that? Did it ever work for you? Did it ever not work for you? See, if it didn't work for you, that isn't what the verse said. And so you develop all these theological gimmicks to explain away why a verse, what it says, didn't work like the verse said it would work because you didn't believe the verse to start with. Because if you don't believe, if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you can't believe the Bible. But when you put it where it goes over here, you'll discover that it will work in the program God gave to the nation Israel. If you study it out, you'll find that. So when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John back here, you're in time past. You're not in the but now. And when the 12 apostles are trained back here to 
carry on their ministry in the book of Acts. As the book of Acts begins, things don't change. Come with me to Acts chapter... Well, look at Matthew 15. Some of you are thinking about this verse on the way. See, when I teach like this, and, and, and some of you have been over this stuff a thousand times, could teach it better than I do, you're already thinking about verses I'm not using that you, you would think I should use. And I'm looking at the clock, and i got some more things I want to do beside this. And, I, and I'd like to go to bed tonight. And I'm sure you would too. That's a wonderful thing. There was a time years ago, we used to have these meetings, and Friday night we called it the chart night. And I teach what I'm doing tonight. And it was all, wow, that's interesting. I said a minute ago, I opened that thing, it was, wow. Then a few years later, everybody already knew that. Teach something else, Brother Rick, so we'd move on. And then new people come in, had to go back and do it. This is, listen, everything we teach in a meeting like this, you need to understand how, how we're thinking to get where we do. That's why this is important. I'm just trying to get all of our minds together on the same, in the same frame of reference. Matthew 15, verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, he answered and said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that's a kick in the seat of the pants for most preachers. You listen to most preachers, most preachers in the evangelical industrial complex of our day, and they do almost all their preaching out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus said, I'm not sent to you guys. I'm just sent to the lost sheep of the house. Do you understand why so many people think they're Israel? They want to claim Israel's blessings. They want, they, they want to say we can heal like Israel can heal. We can get answers to prayer like Israel can get answers to prayer. They want to jump back in the Old Testament so we can get the, the financial blessings like, like, you know, that's an interesting thing. God said back here, I'll bless them, give them all these blessings and so forth to the circumcision. Jesus in here said, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go into the kingdom of God. It was a sign of God's blessing back here to be wealthy. In here, it wasn't so good an idea to be wealthy. Isn't that interesting? But the guys who want to claim the wealth back there, they run over in here and claim the healing promises. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, if you're going to claim the healing promise, you better claim the, 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 the if you're going to claim the health promises, why don't you claim the wealth promises? Because you can claim the health, but you can't be wealthy. <laughs> Do you see why people get confused? Can you understand why people listen to people talk like that? And if they've got half a brain in their head that's awake, they'll say, that's something wrong. And that tells you why most people don't ever say there's anything wrong with it. Because they don't have a half a brain in their mind that's working. Your Christian life won't operate on the basis of ignorance. People say, well, Brother Rick, well, why don't people want to see this? If you talk to the average Christian and show them some of these things, and they say, ah, I'm happy with what I got. Listen, if you're happy being, you know, fat, dumb, and sassy, go ahead. It's okay. I'm happy with what I got. <laughs> well, okay. I'm looking for people that want to have what God has for them, not just to be happy in their religion. Okay? If you don't want it, hey, bless God. I say this on the television and the radio all the time. If you don't like what you're hearing, hang on. Don't change the station. In less than half an hour, somebody will be, else will be talking. They'll probably talk like what you want. Now, here it's going to be a little different because all the guys preaching tomorrow won't be doing that, but <laughs> sleep in. Come with me to Acts chapter 2. Get Acts chapter 2 in one hand, and Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, make it Acts chapter 1. Now again, we're just looking for time past. Acts chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3. Now you got to think about where you are in the book of Hebrews. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John here. You've got Romans to Philemon, where Paul's epistles are, in here. And then after the dispensation of grace goes out, you've got a period of time we call it the tribulation. Christ comes back, and he's going to set up his kingdom over here. 
And there are some books in the Bible, the books of Hebrews through Revelation, that deal specifically with, with that time period. I'll show you right here. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's a great preaching text. Every preacher has preached on that. I used to preach on the street every week for years and years. And many times I'd use that verse, preaching on the street. Because that's a great verse, isn't it? How should we neglect if we ne how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? But if I'm going to teach this passage, I can't just use a verse to try to get people's attention with. I, what is what salvation are we talking about here? Every salvation in the Bible is not the same. Hebrews chapter eleven verse seven says that that Noah moved by faith. Noah moved with fear. He obey. Look at Hebrews eleven. I can't quote the verse all of a sudden. Hebrews eleven verse seven. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the what? Saved. The saving of his house. There's a guy that got his whole house saved by building a boat. Every time you see the word saved in the Bible, it's not talking about missing hell in the lake of fire. Okay? There's different kinds of salvations in the Bible. So you have to look at them. Back here, chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape when we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Now, when was that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What did he preach? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He preached the good news that there was some wrath to come out of which God was going to save a, a, a little flock of believers into that kingdom. The kingdom's coming. He's going to purify the nation and take the believers into it and set up his kingdom. In fact, he taught them to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Now, it'd be an absolute dumb thing for you to pray. We're going. You follow that? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, how could you pray that without, without, without just going, oh, excuse me, Lord? You got a refrigerator and a pantry at home full. You're not worried about a daily bread. Now, you came down here and you didn't have provisions for the motel tonight, but it doesn't look like any of you are going to starve. <laughs> and there's a grocery store right down the hill here, and there's about five restaurants down there. You need to ask God to feed you tomorrow. But there are some people going to be praying for that right out here. And he's going to feed them daily. You know anybody in the Bible ever got fed daily? Yeah, some people in the wilderness. And God fed them with manna every day. You remember that? You know what he's going to do with Israel in the wilderness? Revelation chapter 12, same thing right there. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, verse 3, verse 4, I'm sorry. God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. When did the Holy Spirit come? On the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on them. These people on the day of Pentecost bore witness of what the Lord taught them back here. You see how that verse tells you that this salvation that began here was confirmed in early Acts. Nothing new began on the day of Pentecost. The preacher says, well, the church was birthed on Pentecost. Nonsense. You need to go back and get your money back from seminary. Take those commentaries back and ask for a refund. Nothing started at Pentecost. He says that they were, so, that some of them were added to the church on the day of Pentecost. There was a church there. But it was already there, and they add to it. You don't add to something if it wasn't already there. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 says these are the last days, not the first days. What's going on here is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. It's just a fulfillment of prophecy. It's the next step. Now look back here. By the way, the book of Hebrews is written to Hebrews. Okay? Now verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. That would fit right over here. 
And notice the last part of that, whereof we speak. Where does the writer of the book of Hebrews think he's talking about? Time passed, but now, or? That's important to see. Because if you see where God puts the, the, the things, all of a sudden the confusion that comes from not putting them in the right place goes away. That's why I put Hebrews over here. Because it has to do with the ages to come. How do I know? Chapter 2, verse 5, told me. Got that? Acts chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 6. When they, and that's the 11 apostles, were, uh, therefore were come together, they asked of him, of Jesus, saying, Lord, without this time, start the church, the body of Christ. Uh, no, that's not. That, they, even the new Bibles don't do that. Without restore again the kingdom to Israel. Again, they understood back here, and as Acts started, that kingdom with Israel is the program. You're still in time past because God's still dealing with the nation of Israel. Chapter 2, Peter, is, they're, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance. Peter says in verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Who's he talking to? He doesn't have any idea, any mistake about it. God, the Holy Spirit, through Peter says, this is Israel's program. Look at chapter 11. Chapter 11. Verse 19. Now when they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution of Stephen, and that'll be Acts 8.1, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. What program do they think they're under? Time passed. So when do things change? We'll look over at chapter, the next book, the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Get Romans 11 in one hand. And Ephesians chapter 3 in one hand. Romans 11, Ephesians 3. Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11, 13. For I speak unto you Gentiles, in that I am the, uh, as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Jesus Christ saves a guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul, and makes Paul the apostle of the Gentiles, of the uncircumcision down here. Ephesians chapter 3, here's how it happened. Ephesians 3, by, by the way, go back, to, hold on, go back to Romans just a minute, start reading in verse 11. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, talking about Israel? God forbid, but rather through their fall, Salvation has come to the Gentiles, so to provoke them to jealousy. Notice, shall they, have they stumbled that they should fall? They stumble, but they don't fall. But then through the fall, then there come a point where they do fall. And that point's going to be in Acts 7 with Stephen. And then they do fall. And as a result of their fall, salvation goes to the Gentiles. How? Paul said, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So it's through the fall of Israel that God set Israel aside and raised up a new, a new apostle, the apostle Paul. Ephesians 3 tells you how this happened or why it happened. Ephesians 3, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now God is not dealing on the basis of this distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Now he's set the nation Israel aside, and now everybody's down here on this cut-off basis. Romans 11 said he's, he's, he's concluded them all in unbelief, not just the Gentiles, but Israel too, that he might have mercy upon all. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, 
how that by revelation Christ made known to me the mystery. Notice what he calls that program, a mystery. Which in other ages, verse 5, well, verse, verse 3 says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when ye read, and me understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Can I tell you, you're never going to understand this stuff if you don't read your Bible. You can try to show people this until you are blue in the face. If they don't read their Bible, they're not going to get it. Christian people today in the evangelical world have been so poorly served by their leaders that the average Christian knows so little about the details of God's Word that when you begin to talk to them about the details of God's Word, their eyes just glaze over. And it's like trying to talk to somebody about reading when they, they can't even put ABC together. And you have to go back there and start with it. But your Christian life won't operate on the basis of ignorance of God's Word. You've got to read this stuff. Your best bet is just put the verse there in front of them. I sat with a pastor. We're looking at these things. And that's what the verse says. He says, well, Brother Rick, I think I'll have to pray about that. I said, Brother, you can pray for three weeks about it. It ain't going to change what that verse says. You don't need to pray about it. You just need to believe it or don't believe it. And you can pray about whether you're going to believe it or not. But don't pray about what the verse says. There it says. That. It says what it says. And you can go to bed tonight and get up in the morning and the words aren't going to crawl around on the page and say something different. You know. And what most people, what most preachers want to do is, you know, take a little, drink a glass of milk, take an aspirin, go to bed, and hope tomorrow comes up different. It won't be the same thing. You read it. And when you read it, what does it say? You can understand. I'm going to say again, you can't believe the Bible without rightly dividing it. Whereby when you read, verse 4, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. That means in other ages, this information was not made known. Back here, they didn't know about this. He says, for preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Verse 9, to make all men see what is fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. This information was not revealed. It was hidden. You take that chart, and there's the prophetic program. If you hold your hand here and look at Acts chapter 3, I'm giving up right now. I want you to know I, I've got nine different illustrations of the differences that I was going to try to get to, and I'm if I'd have been talking 90 miles an hour, I'd have got there, but I didn't have the gas tonight to do that. <laughs> now, you don't look like you had the gas to listen that way. Here's the great division in the Bible. Acts 3.19, Peter, Peter's talking, verse 18. But those things which God hath before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Everything that the Word of God predicted about the cross work of Jesus Christ, he's done. There's a wonderful passage in John 19. When you look into the Savior's heart, and he says, in order that this verse might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. He's literally hanging on that cross, ticking off the verses in his mind. And he said, you know, there's one more verse that hadn't been fulfilled. So then Psalm 69 and he said, I thirst. So they did exactly what the verse said. And then it said, he said, it's finished. Everything the prophet said, been accomplished. And then he bowed his head. His head was erect. None of this passion of the, of the Christ that one of the dude's name did. You know, if he had been a Bible believer, he said the passion of Christ passion of the Christ, that's for people that don't believe in the deity of Christ. Sun Yun Moon said he was the Christ. 
the Christ person. Jesus Christ wasn't the Christ person. He was God in the flesh. He was Christ. A little subtlety sometimes. By the way, all the new Bibles put the the in there. With no text, no reason except that they, well, anyway. Dumb Christians don't catch it. Satan is more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said, yea, hath God said. And he subtly changes your Bible, and you don't even know it. Because you weren't reading it to start with to notice. And when you were reading it, you weren't reading it carefully. Anyway, that's, that's, that's another topic. <laughs> Prophecy. And what Pete's saying here is everything the prophets had said has been fulfilled. Now, what comes next after that? Wrath. And what Pete's saying is, look, if everything's been fulfilled up to this point, the next thing is wrath, you better get right. Peanut man sat on a track, his heart was in a flutter, around the bend came the train, toot toot, peanut butter. <laughs> you sit on the track and you're going to be peanut butter. So that's, and that, that's the idea here. Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now wait a minute. All the things have been spoken since the world began. But what did Paul just say? Here's something that's kept secret since the world began. Listen, you can be so out of it that you couldn't pass kindergarten and you can get that. You don't need a preacher that knows Greek and Hebrew and been to seminary and got 15 degrees. All you got to do is just read a verse. That which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets prophecy. And then there's something that was kept secret since the world began. The mystery. And it was revealed through the ministry. That's why Paul's in the Bible. And that's who we are today. That's the most basic division in your Bible. Back over here, the program is law. In here, the program is grace. Can I tell you that makes a difference? When Paul says we are not under the law, the law is Bible. He said there's a part of the Bible that you're not under its direction, its authority, and its instruction. You're under grace. There's a part of the Bible that you're under its direction, its authority, and its instruction. Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, how do you explain that? Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? I don't like that word. It's really a contrast. One program in contrast to another. But if you don't understand how to rightly divide the word, it is a contradiction. I'll try one with you. You know what God tells Israel back there? He said, if you don't tithe 23% of your income every year, you're robbing God. I read an article just today about a big mega church, two mega churches in our area that are falling apart. They're, they're, they're all, they all are now because of the culture change. Mega churches were, were a result of, of the culture of the 80s and the great hoax that went on. And they're falling apart now, and they will fall apart because the culture is changing, and you can't change fast enough to save a sinking ship. But the article is talking about this great big, big mega church in Chicago that the attendance and the tithing is going down. Now, what they mean by tithing is the collection. Your Bible doesn't mean whatever you put in the collection is the tithe. The Bible means 10%. And the Bible doesn't even say 10% for Israel. Leviticus 27, they would, have, they would give 
10% of the gross income of their product, of their production. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 14, they would have given another 10% of the net income that they had. Now that was one you would like. The first one, you had, the first one was an income tax that you gave to the Levites to run the government of Israel, the priesthood. The second one in Deuteronomy 14 is what's called a festival tithe. You, you, you took that tithe off of the net income and you put that aside for yourself. So that three times a year, every man in Israel had to go to Jerusalem, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And you had to go, it's a festival. You know what a festival is? That's a hoot nanny. We're going to go have a party. We're going to have a Mardi Gras. We're going to have a camp meeting. And he says, you take that tithe and you finance your vacation, your holiday, your holy day, holiday, and you use that because no matter where an Israeli was, he was required to go to Jerusalem. You couldn't observe Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles anywhere except in Jerusalem. That's where God said observe it. And you were to go there. And you had the money to do it. Then there was a third tithe you gave every, every three years, which was for the welfare, the poor and needy. Averages out 23%. He didn't say you could do it, not do it. He said, you owe me 23%. Malachi 3, you've all heard the verse, will a man rob God? Where have he robbed him? Tithes and offerings. So you gave the tithe, the 10%, the 23%, plus the average evangelical, according to Barna's research, they give about 3% of their income. That's not a tithe. We need to have a stewardship campaign here. No. You know what you need to do? Instead of quoting Malachi chapter 3, and by the way, Jesus, you know what he told us with the Pharisees? He said, you tithe, and then you tithe mint and anise, you tithe on every little thing, and you leave the weightier matters. You ought to tithe, but you ought to do the other stuff too. So Jesus didn't take them out front of the tithe system. He said, you should do it. But you ought not think that doing that gets you out from under the, the moral obligations. Now, you come over here to Paul, and he says, let a man give as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not of necessity. You robbed God, what, in your tithes. That sounds like necessity to me. You got that? Not of necessity. Commanded to tithe? Forget about it. Now you like that, don't you? <laughs> Whew, thank God! No. <laughs> They're different. If you can't see the difference, you can't see. Brother Rick, I just can't see it. Okay, I got it. You can't see it. But I bet you, I bet you can when they feed you drive home tonight, you just don't want to see it because you're happy where you are. Okay, be happy where you are. For the people that want to see it, that's an illustration. It's commanded, not commanded. Well, what is it? And what's the explanation for what it is? That's what rightly dividing is about. See that? That's why it's important. I'll give you another one. You know a guy named Saul in the Old Testament? Spirit of God came on Saul. First Kings chapter 10. Six chapters later, the Spirit of God left him. We had a guy call our radio program just this, this past week. We're on six days a week on the radio in Chicago. Last week, of Tuesday it was, a guy called and he said, Tell me again about this stuff about not losing my salvation because I think I've lost it. And he thought the Spirit of God had left him. Well, he left Saul, never came back. Samson, you remember Samson? The Spirit of God came on him. He went out and whipped on the Philistines. He got his hair cut, Delilah's barbershop, and the Spirit of God left him. 
Then he's over there, and the Philistines have got him. And he says, Lord, just let me one last time bring the house down. And the Spirit of God came back. And he pulled the house down, killed himself with all the Philistines. So there's a guy, had it, lost it, got it back. There's a guy, lost it, had it, lost it, couldn't get it back. David, King David, Psalm 51, after he'd committed all that sin with Bathsheba and murdered her husband and covered it up, he said, oh, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. There's the great king of Israel, the martyr of Israel, thinking he could lose the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that'd scare the bejeebers out of me because I would be qualified to lose him. He is called the Holy Spirit. Every time you have an unholy thought, and you have a few of those every hour or two. I mean, I'm looking at the crowd. I can, I, I, I see who's here. So what do we do with that? You know what Paul says? He says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So when you get saved, God takes you and puts you in the body of Christ. And when he puts you in the body of Christ, we're then sealed with the Holy Spirit, not by him, but with him. You're baptized by him, but you're sealed with him. God, the Holy Spirit, literally comes and encapsulizes your inner man. And you live as a believer in the encapsulized environment of God, the Holy Ghost. And he seals you. Now, a seal in the Bible is for a couple of things. One is it shows identification. You belong to him, but it also shows security and permanence. When a man seals you, it might not work. They seal the tomb of Jesus, and he just came on out anyway. But the angel takes Satan and seals him, puts him in the bottom of this pit, puts a seal on, seal on him. Hard as he wanted to kick, he couldn't get out until God opened it up and let him out. A thousand years. When God seals something, it's permanent. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise under the day of redemption. That seal lasts for us. So you get the Holy Spirit, and he's a permanent possession. Now, that's us. Not th Don't go back over here and be tortured about, oh, I've sinned. Delilah's, I've visited Delilah's hair, you know, barbershop, and I've sinned. I'm going to lose the power of God in my life. I lose the, you know, that's not, how do you know that? If you don't rightly divide the word, you can't believe your Bible. Just those are different systems. Which one are you under? You got to know. So when you go through these things, and you see these things, and you see the differences in the way they, they operate, you need to appreciate that right division is the only thing that actually gives you the capacity to actually believe your Bible. Now I want to do one last one with you, and this one is important. By the way, you can preach a gospel back here that, that does not contain the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The twelve apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom, and Luke chapter 18 says, when Jesus began to tell them about going to Jerusalem and die, they didn't believe him. They didn't understand it, and it was hidden from them. And yet they had spent years preaching the gospel of the kingdom without knowing about the, the fact that Jesus is going to die when it's supposed to be resurrected. So don't think that every gospel in the Bible is the same. When you tell people there's more than one good news, more, more than one gospel in the Bible, say, oh, 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 no, there's only one gospel. That's because they've been living, listening to a bunch of Calvinists who don't have sense enough to know what the Bible says anyway. They just know what their system says. To not know there's more than one Bible, gospel in the Bible is to never read the Bible. You can't believe the Bible when it says there's more than one gospel, if you don't write and divide it. But if you do, you can, because then you understand there's only one gospel today for us. These gospels back here aren't us. So you can believe your Bible and understand there are more than one gospel in the Bible. You just understand there isn't but one for us today, and that's the gospel Paul preached, which is that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's the gospel, the grace of God was delivered to Paul, he preaches. 
That's our gospel today. There are people in the Bible time past that preached gospel that didn't know about that. When you rightly divide, you can believe your Bible. If you don't, you just got confusion. And you have to deny what the Bible actually says. Now, I want you to say something in that regard. Look with me at Matthew chapter 20 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. Matthew 20 and 1 Timothy 2. We're almost finished. We're, we're going to quit. Matthew 20. One of the guys in our media room the other day was playing a, a tape. They were testing some, some equipment. They were playing a, a, a CD of me preaching. And <clears throat> they put it on double speed. And it sounded like I used to sound 25 years ago. <laughs> and Bob said, so you slowed down, Richard. Because I've got that on double speed. That sounded like you used to sound. So congratulations. It's better for you now. Because people used to say, don't talk so fast. Well, you got a lot to say. i got twice as much in. You're getting short change tonight. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for what? Many. Many. Look at chapter 26. The night before Jesus died. Matthew 26. Verse 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mission of sins. Those are the verses that the religious church operators used to say Christ didn't die for everybody, he just died for many. And you know why they say that? Because that's what the verse said. If you take the many, if you go to Isaiah 53, and, and Isaiah says, for the sins of my people, that's Israel, he died. And that his death will justify many, Talking about Israel. He said, okay. And Israel is God's elect, so he only died for the elect. The problem for the Calvinists is that the elect in the past just is Israel. <laughs> and you're not Israel. What is that? That's time past. Okay. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because here's good news. 1 Timothy 2 verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that's different, isn't it? Many has become all. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. The many has become all. But watch, to be testified in due time. Well, who is the due time testifier of the fact Christ gave himself to be a ransom not just for Israel, but for everybody? Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Uh, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. There's an advance in information. Different. And you don't have to let the theologians in their confusion. Try to make out like the difference isn't there when you can read it and see it is. The answer is to rightly divide God's Word. You cannot believe God's Word the way it stands unless you rightly divide it. Now that reminds me to say, today is Valentine's Day. I hope you guys took care of that. If you didn't, I apologize for mentioning it. <laughs> 1477, a couple of years, I just read a couple of years ago in the British Museum, they were looking through some old books and they opened up a book and found the letter written in 1477. And they say it's the oldest Valentine on record. And it was written by a lady to a young man <coughs> accepting his proposal for marriage. 
declaring her love for him, accepting his love for her. And the story is that they married, had a family, and one of their children became one of the heroes of the British Empire, of the English throne at that time. And that's, that's considered to be the oldest Valentine on record. But I want to tell you there's an older one. Because God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't loving him. It's wonderful to love and wonderful to be loved. But we weren't loving him. We'd made a God in our own image. You ever read over in Romans 1? When the new God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. But became vain in their imagination. Empty, stupid ideas came into their head. Professing on themselves to be wise, they became fools. They said they turned the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. And that's what we've done. We make God in our own image. We think the throne he sits on would better fit us than him. And you know why I know the God of the Bible is the God of creation? Is because no human, no religion in the world has ever made a God like the God of the Bible. We make them all in our own image. You'd never think about having a God who would love you when you didn't love him. And then but coming, coming down into our humanity and living in our humanity perfectly. That condemns you, buddy. When we were going through grace school of the Bible, they have to take tests. And when I was giving them the test to start with, I said, now here's the way we're going to grade. I'm going to give you a test and there's 100% X number of questions and the person that gets the most questions, if there's 20 and only 18 are, are, are right, that's gonna be the top number. That'll be the denominator. And what you get will be the numerator, and that'll be your percentage. That'll take care of, that, that's the curve. And that'll take care of the curve because that'll take care of any teacher error. And the problem that we had with that was that when Brother John went through the class, he aced every test. <laughs> He screwed the curve up for everybody. <laughs> he even got all of the bonus questions. And so a lot of the guys didn't like Brother John. <laughs> well, Jesus did that because he perfectly lived in our humanity. And then he went to the cross. And God demonstrated, he commended. He said, let me recommend love to you and that while you didn't love him you were thumbing your nose in his face giving your finger to him the one he created he died for you Jesus told his disciples greater love has no man than a, down, a friend lay down his life for his friend that's humanly speaking but while you were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When you couldn't fix it. You didn't want to, but you couldn't if you wanted to. And maybe you did want to. Maybe you tried and it didn't work. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but peradventure some, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love for us, toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the good news. That's the complete understanding of what God did at the cross. If you've never trusted him, the verse says, I delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, that he raised again the third day according to the scriptures. You can take God's word for it. You can believe his word on it. Christ died for you. You didn't deserve it. 
He didn't ask you to. People say, well, don't you have to repent? Turn from your sin. That's the big deal today. I heard a guy just here on the radio we're riding around here today. He said, you need to repent and trust Christ. That's two things. People say, we believe in sola fide, faith only. Well, then why did you tell me to do two things? Ask them there. Don't ask me. I'll just tell you one thing. Believe. Paul says he's just and justifier of them which believe in Jesus. And if you'll quit trusting yourself, then just trust him to save you. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to pray a prayer. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to quit something. You don't have to say, I'm going to start something. You just say, Lord, I can't do it. I'll trust you to do it. And when you come to that place in your life, he'll save you. When you rely exclusively on him to be the savior he died and rose again for you to be. That's something you do in the quietness and stillness and personal privacy of your own heart. That's what faith requires. God looks down here tonight and looks at your heart. And he knows what you're trusting. You trust his son, his savior. Now, that produces life. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Your Christian life is exactly the same. He doesn't save you and then say, okay, now go get on the treadmill and show me what a good deal I got. There is no treadmill. He says, now Christ in you is the hope of glory. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, in my body right here in flesh and blood, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave us. How is it that Jesus lived in our humanity? He lived in complete and total dependence on the will and the word of his Father. He said, without my Father, I can do nothing. I said, without my Savior, I can do nothing. I live like he lived. And then it's his life. And we're going to talk about all that tomorrow. This, it's yellow because it's supposed to be gold. <laughs> this is what God's doing today. And when you take God's word, and you let it renew your mind. You let it instruct your thinking about whatever it is in your life you're facing. It works. That's good news, folks. You can be happy about that. You can rejoice in that. That sets you free. It sets you free from sin, that separates you from God and from one another. It reconciles you to God in one body. You can be reconciled to God and to one in, 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 in Christ and to one another in the church by the cross. So well, that's what we're here to rejoice in this weekend. If you've got a question about that, something that's not clear to you, especially about your salvation. There are people all over this room would be happy to talk with you the rest of the evening. Answer your questions over an open Bible. Just ask somebody. If they can't answer it, they can get you to somebody that can. But just don't go out of here without having those things settled in your heart and your mind forever. Father, we thank you tonight.